All right, looks like we got everybody and uh, Coach has now joined us. So with that, we'll turn it over to Coach Clausen for an opening statement and then we'll uh, open it up for questions. All right, uh, hello everybody. Hope you're all doing well. And uh, it's good to see you again after two weeks. So we're excited to get back in game week. Uh, you know, before I get going, um, obviously a big announcement on our campus today with uh, Dr. Hatch announcing his retirement. And uh, I'm certainly grateful for the opportunity to work for Dr. Hatch for the past seven years. Uh, he's been extremely supportive of our program, uh, of our athletic program. And uh, it was great to have a president that was willing to get into the, the weeds about student athlete issues. You know, his different roles with the ACC, with the NCAA, um, you know, I think a lot of people understand that the big picture, he understood a lot of the details and was always uh, helpful and always accommodating and always had time um, when issues came up. And, and I really enjoyed working for him and congratulate him on an incredible career and also his retirement. So hopefully that includes continuing to attend Wake Forest football games because he's always been, been a big fan and has met with our team multiple times. And just an example of his leadership is meeting with our football team this year before they took a vote as presidents whether to play the season or not. I thought that was really um, a first class move by Dr. Hatch that he did want to hear what our student athletes had to say and our, our team was grateful for that. Uh, moving on, um, it's weird. It feels like our third opener. We had an opener with Clemson and then we had an unexpected bye week and then it felt like another opener with Campbell and now it's two more weeks and it feels like almost another opener. Um, you know, we need to play games um, and we're gonna hopefully have a chance to do that now three weeks in a row, but certainly the bye week was very productive for us. Uh, you know, you're, we're breaking in nine new starters on offense. And I think getting that time to continue to get those guys to gel and play together um, is only gonna help us uh, certainly some of the younger players were playing in the secondary. Um, you know, sometimes the difference between an average player and a good player is 5,000 reps. And then the difference between a good player and a great player is another 5,000 reps. And with missing spring football, it's just all the accumulation of reps that these players are getting in practice. Um, I really hope will make us an improved, and I've told the team an ascending football team as the year goes on. And we're certainly gonna have to be that. Um, you know, if you look at our schedule, there's certainly an argument this might be the most challenging schedule ever played uh, in the history of Wake Forest football with 10 conference opponents. Um, and, you know, Virginia is the returning uh, Coastal Division uh, champion. Um, you know, I certainly have as much respect for Bronco Mendenhall as any head coach in the ACC. Uh, he's somebody that I, visit with over the phone. Um, we've certainly shared a lot of ideas with each other uh, on how to, our teams have handled the pandemic uh, protocols, doing everything we can to keep our team safe. And he's somebody I have a great deal of respect for. I think he's one of those coaches that's truly in it for the right reasons, uh, who deeply cares about his student athletes and has certainly prioritized their health and safety. And he's also a really good football coach. Certainly his record at BYU and the job he's done at Virginia, um, you know, they have progressively built their program very similar to how we have. Started slow and just got better every single year. So uh, they're extremely uh, creative on offense. They probably manufacture as much offense as anybody in the conference. Uh, they have high-end skill at the running back position in the tight end position and the receiver position. Uh, the receiver, Kemp, uh, he's from the same high school as Greg Dortch, and he reminds me a lot of Greg in terms of his ability to get in and out of cuts. They certainly target him a lot. Um, the, the running back, uh, Talia Papua, or Papa, I'm not sure if I'm saying the name correctly, uh, but he never goes down on the first hit. Uh, it's an extremely veteran offensive line with over 150 games played, and it'll be, I think, 115 starts between them. Uh, the tight end is a grad transfer who's 6'7", 265. 
And then they have a new weapon in Lavelle Davis, who's a six, seven freshman receiver that's made a lot of big plays for them. Uh, defensively, I mean, just outstanding. They have a number of players who are as good as anybody in the ACC. Uh, guys that really stick out to me on film are the safety blunt, um, who is a, a really physical player. Uh, you know, certainly uh, Noah Taylor is a very long athletic Sam linebacker that they do a lot with, very similar to what Clemson did with Isaiah Simmons a year ago. Uh, Snowden's a very high-end player. Um, they've got a lot of veterans on defense, um, and they're combined too deep. They have 34 seniors and juniors, so this might be the oldest, most experienced football team uh, that we've played my entire time here. You know, every year I look at the depth chart or every week and look at the amount of juniors and seniors relative to the freshmen and sophomores on the depth chart. And I have, by my count, they have uh, 34 seniors and juniors on the depth chart. So this is a, a good, experienced, well-coached football team that, again, is the defending coastal champion right now. So with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Dave, I was going to ask you about the what you said about practice reps. You know, this extra time you've had with the new starters offensively to maybe get, get them more reps. How much of a difference in practice reps versus game reps in terms of how much improvement you can make? You, you've got a lot of practice reps, but you need the game reps, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you make more improvement in game reps because that, that gives you the, the film and the experience to teach off of. Uh, but practice reps, especially in the positions that were younger, uh, are really important. Um, and, and I think more than anything, it's the process of building depth on our offensive line. You know, not only do we have nine new starters on offense, but then you have nine new backups. And those guys are a play away from having to go in. So in the bye week, we really focused on getting our twos and threes extra, extra work. We got the one some work, um, but we did an extra practice that all we did was kept all the younger guys out there and gave them an hour and a half and got them wrapped up and accumulated reps for them. And then, you know, to me in the secondary is the one position um, that we just need to continue to, you know, we're, we're, we're more of a veteran group up front, but the secondary is extremely young. And anytime that those guys can get out there and communicate whatever the checks are or the support calls, so it becomes second nature, uh, that's really important. Uh, so again, that is a position that we have to have growth at, and I think we will. I feel really good about the the talent we have there. Um, I think we've done a really good job recruiting that position, and I think uh, we're close to being back to where we were at one point. Um, but you know, again, those guys need reps, and so in that way, the bye week was was very productive. And now we'll find out how productive when we play a game again. Dave, how did that bye week change for you in terms of um, with the way it is in the middle of this early in the season? Did you focus much on Virginia during that bye week? Did, did you practice more than usual during a normal bye week? Um, well, we practiced, uh, you know, we, we had the vets, we had the whole team practice Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and then we had the, uh, we just kept, we took like the 25 players on our team that have been multiple year players and had probably over a thousand game reps. We gave them Wednesday off and practiced all the younger guys. And so in a lot of position, the two was the one um, and the three was the two and we ran a normal practice and we just gave those guys a ton of reps. Now in some positions, the starters were there right now. Kalen Carson is a starter for us, but he doesn't have a thousand game reps and, and the thousands, a, a very loose number, um, you know, but generally speaking, if they have played for us more than this year, you know, at running back Christian Beal and Ken Walker did not practice on that Wednesday. Uh, Donovan Green did not practice, but um, in other positions, Nick Anderson practiced, Kalen Carson practiced, JJ Roberts practiced, and just giving those guys reps with the mindset that you're the one, you're the starter. Uh, because you're a play away from being the starter, I, I think was really valuable for us. And again, especially in missing spring, um, 
you know, I, I feel there is going to be a benefit to this and, and hopefully it shows up on Saturday. So Dave, we, we didn't talk. do last, last week, we really focused on Wake Forest. And then we started on the weekend, starting to introduce Virginia. But when you have a few more days, you know, you can, instead of one day doing all your situations, you can do first and second down on Saturday, and then maybe add red zone on Sunday, and then third down on Tuesday. You get a little bit more time to focus on some of the situational stuff. Dave, when we talked after the Campbell game, you mentioned something about not really knowing this team's identity. Now, here it is, it's the middle of October and you're gonna be playing the fourth game. And I'm curious how much you can find out about the identity in these off weeks and with two weeks between games and, and that kind of delay. You know, Connor, it's, it's challenging. I, I think I have a, a better idea of the direction we're heading, um, but certainly, you know, there's some things in, in the Campbell game that we did well, but in some cases, you know, is that going to work against an ACC team? You know, against Campbell, there's a lot of favorable matchups. Now, I love the way we ran the football. I thought our O-line played at a, a high level. Um, you know, I, I thought we did some good things coverage-wise in the secondary, which are improvement. You know, but now can we carry that over and, and do it against an ACC team? And so. I have a direction that we're heading and I think where our identity is going. Uh, but I certainly, you know, this is still a work in progress. And, and I think it's no different here than other places, Connor. It's just, you know, we're used to breaking the team in and players in in a little different way. Um, and, you know, but again, it's just the, the nature of the pandemic and how the schedule changed. Um, you know, that we're just kind of learning as we, we go here, but it's, uh, it's baptism by fire for a lot of these guys, but that's okay. We'll, we'll end up being better because of it. Hey, Dave, it's Hank in, in Virginia. Um, obviously, you know, all the reps you were talking about and maybe allowing some Knicks to heal in the, you know, one game in three weeks situation are advantages. Are there other advantages to playing one game in three weeks? And what are the disadvantages? I think the disadvantage is our guys are just sick of practice. Um, you can over prepare for an opponent. I think sometimes if you spend more than seven or eight days on an opponent, it, it gets stale. And so that's always the art of, okay, you have a bye week and you have extra time. And even though as a staff, we have our plan together, I, I think you can introduce the opponent too soon. And by the time the game gets there, the players are stale of the game plan. You know, part of the challenge of the weekly schedule is you got one week and the urgency of getting a game plan together. Um, I don't like to introduce an opponent too early. You know, and, and right now, I, I just think our guys are sick of practicing. You know, really, they've been here quarantining under all these protocols since July. And so it's been three and a half months and we've played three games. And I just think our players want to play a game. Um, and that's going to happen. And hopefully if we can continue to do a good job uh, managing COVID, that we'll be able to play three games in a row here. Do you think being sick of practice turns into hunger? I hope so. I hope so. I mean, they're, they're anxious to play. I mean, there's, uh, you know, there's the balance of, of hunger and anxious to play a game, uh, but also getting out of the rhythm of when you get into a normal season, there's a rhythm to the season. And we have yet to get into a rhythm here. So again, I'm, I'm hopeful the next three weeks we can get into a rhythm. Dave, you have uh, Trey Rucker back for the first time this season. What does he give you that you didn't have before? But just, um, <laughs> you know, with uh, Kobe out and Luke out, you know, he becomes one of our, one of our most experienced safeties. And, uh, you know, and he's only a, a true sophomore. So, again, I, you can't have enough good players in the secondary. Uh, that's where, you know, if you want to run multiple packages, having those guys on special teams, you know, those type of athletes in the secondary, uh, you can't have enough of them. And getting Trey back is really helpful. Uh, you know, he's a good tackler. Uh, he's played 
you know, more football than, than any other safety other than the steer. And, uh, you know, so getting him back helps us, but, you know, he's still relatively young. So, um, but he played a lot of football last year and uh, has confidence to him. And, uh, you know, we know what he's capable of, but he's also missed a lot of time. So, uh, you know, there's going to be some rust there with him as well. Dave, you mentioned all the practices and the guys kind of getting sick of it. Is there any one thing that maybe you guys did to break the monotony, like showed up one day and decided not to practice or practice less? Or was there any one time where you kind of said, okay, these guys need a break from it? Well, we just, we gave them the Monday off, then we gave our veterans the Wednesday off, and then we gave them Friday off. And then even the Tuesday, Thursday, we really limited their reps. Okay. So there's this balance of giving them rest, but also they've got to have a certain activity level and a certain load or they're, they're much more susceptible to injury the next week. So with our strength coaches and trainers and uh, the different things that we use, um, you know, we just can't give them a week off and not think that we're not going to pay an injury price the next week. So, you know, we use that catapult system and we study their load. And um, so we're, we got to get enough activity and that they stay in shape and it's important to practice. So they stay in football shape, but we, we, you know, of those of that week, you know, after the Friday night game, they did not practice Saturday, Sunday, Monday, they went light Tuesday, they were off Wednesday, they went light Thursday, and then we were back in at Saturday. So we did not, in my opinion, I mean, they'll probably tell you we practice too much, but they're always gonna tell you that. Coach, we spoke to Taylor Morin earlier and he said, he thinks some teams in the ACC may look down on you guys based on your record. So what would you like to see your team show the conference this Saturday against Virginia Tech, or excuse me, Virginia? Well, we, we obviously, we want to, we want to win. I mean, I don't worry what other people think of us. I think we are what we are. We worry about ourselves um, and our improvement. And if we get better as a team and played our abilities, the record and the respect take care of itself. So again, I don't really get too involved with what people outside of our program think. Um, you know, if we want respect, we have to earn that on the field and you got to earn it by getting, getting a win. Dave, in addition to get Trey Rucker back, you also got Rondell Bothroyd on the depth chart for the first time. What can he bring to that defensive line? Rondell's a good player. Um, getting him back is, is really helpful. I mean, he's a good pass rusher, very versatile. And Rondell just has a knack for making plays. He has a knack for getting off of blocks, uh, getting him back is, I mean, he's one of our better D linemen. So that's a, a really good, uh, he's had a great rehab. He's worked really hard and, and we're excited to have him back on the field. And in general, what's the kind of prognosis for Luke Masterson? Um, we're hoping we'll have him back after the next bye week. So he'll probably be out the next three weeks um, and then hoping to have him back, uh, you know, sometime in, in early November. It's a foot, right? Yeah, yep. Dave, do you account differently for how to defend Virginia, whether Armstrong plays or Lindell Stone, or does the fact that Stone was in comeback mode the whole game kind of void anything you saw there? Well, th their skill sets are a little bit different. Um, you know, they, they certainly threw it a lot more with Stone, and I think part of that is his skill set, but it's also when you're behind, you know, yeah, I'm sure if Armstrong was in, they would have thrown it more too. So they're, uh, you know, they, they ran the same offense. They run very similar plays. Um, certainly with Stone, a lot of the pocket passes were passes. Uh, with Armstrong, a lot of those plays become almost quarterback draws or quarterback runs. Um, you know, Armstrong is a very good athlete and a very aggressive um, and punishing runner. I mean, he's 215 pounds and he does not avoid contact. Um, you know, he's almost like tackling another tailback. So it's different. Um, they have other guys that have played quarterback for him that they have working at receiver. Um, and so I think we have to be ready for their entire offense. 
over with the Cincinnati Bengals, Jesse Bates is having the best year of his career. Um, I'm curious, when he was at Wake Forest, what did you see in him and how did he become such a big contributor so quickly? Well, uh, Jesse was a, a very late commit for us. He was committed to Toledo. Uh, we were really his only power five offer. He might've got one other one late. And uh, Jesse was just a, a great instinctive athlete, good basketball player, good baseball player. Uh, when he got to Wake Forest, it was the first time he had ever just focused on football. And he really wasn't ready to play as a true freshman. Uh, we redshirted him. We had some older safeties that year. Um, but you could tell on scout team that this is a guy that has instincts. Um, and then the next two years, he became one of the best safeties in the ACC. Uh, great instincts, really good ball skills. He was also a really good punt returner for us. Um, and Jesse just had it. Um, he had the ability to diagnose a play, to take proper angles. He was a very good open field alley tackler. Uh, he had the ability to play man to man on a slot. And he was also a really good center fielder. So just uh, an outstanding player for us and uh, not surprised that he's having success with the Bengals. And then you mentioned he was committed to Toledo. How did you find him? Because again, he wasn't the most highly, highly sought after guy. Um, you know, we just, we evaluate a lot of players every year and, um, you know, our, our safeties coach and defensive coordinator at the time watched his film. And I remember one night uh, we had a safety who was committed to us who decommitted and went to the University of Minnesota. And so this was like a week before signing date. And I was in a hotel room somewhere and Mike Elko was somewhere else and we were going back and forth and we were looking at all these safeties. And he said, the, the one player I really like is this guy, Jesse Bates. And he had me watch the film. And I always have a bias towards three sport athletes. Uh, I love guys that are good basketball players. I love guys who are outfielders in baseball that also are free safeties. Because I just think judging the ball off the bat and judging uh, the ball off the arm and having that space and distant and hand-eye coordination skill set um, I think there's a lot of carryover and, you know, he had height. He was just a little underdeveloped and that's really what we do here at Wake Forest is we take those guys that maybe the bigger programs don't want uh, because maybe they're an inch short or 15 pounds lighter. And we have confidence in our program that we can develop those guys and put the weight on them and make them good football players. And, and Jesse was exhibit A. Dave, what what discuss, what discussion last year led to the heavy package with multiple tight ends going on the field? And then what was the process of, of keeping that as a staple of the offense this year for short guarded situations? Well, you know, we last year we were I think we were the best third down team in the ACC. But we weren't very good at third and one and fourth and one that we were better third and three, third and four, third and six than we were third and fourth and one. And as you know, Coach Ruggiero is as about as thorough and well-researched a football coach as you'll ever meet. And he's very good at recognizing, okay, we're good at these things and we need improvement. And it, when he researches something now, I mean, he's going, I mean, and, and he researched some people that are doing this stuff and felt that we needed to come up with a different short yardage package. Um, and we worked on it really hard this camp. Um, and we also felt for the first time in a long time that we had enough, uh, we had enough tight ends to run it. And certainly uh, we are older at tailback in terms of Christian and Kenneth played a lot. So they understand how to fit those plays, just not even as the ball carrier, but as the off back. Uh, so it was, uh, Again, we were really, really good on offense a year ago. That was probably the one area uh, that we weren't as good as we wanted to be. And so we, we, didn't, we wanted to research different ways of approaching short yardage and goal line. And, uh, and so far, it's been a successful package for us. Was the biggest hang up just needing to sub, like needing to sub and let the defense sub when you get down there on the one or two yard line? No, I mean, I, th I think there's times that there's merits to going fast so they can't sub. You know, if a team has their nickel or their dime package out there, 
Um, we certainly have ways of still doing that. I, I think more than anything, it was just a matter of our tight ends now look different than a year ago. Um, last year, we had an outstanding tight end, Jack Frudenthal. But Jack was really a converted receiver playing tight end. Um, and so we didn't really want to take Jack Frudenthal off the field for critical downs. Um, this year, our, the skill set of our tight ends are a little bit different. Uh, both Blake Whitehart and Chapman are bigger. I think they're a little more physical at the point of attack. Um, and because of the way that we're made this year, it lent itself to doing some different things, short yardage goal line. So um, I don't regret what we did a year ago. Uh, Jack Frudenthal made some big plays for us in goal line, play actions, um, made a lot of big third down conversions for us last year. The BC game, the third and two or three, the slant he caught. Um, but I think every year you've got to look at your football team, uh, look at the, the strengths of your personnel, and, and you find different ways to use them. So you maximize the things they do well and you minimize the things they don't do as well. And I think Warren Ruggiero and our offensive staff do an outstanding job of analyzing that every year. Dave, this is kind of off the beaten path, but I heard uh, or saw on the internet somewhere about you being a bouncer back when you were a grad assistant. Is, uh, is there, was it like Roadhouse or how, how did that work out when you were uh, scrambling for money and, you know. I was just trying know, to make, end, I was trying to make ends meet. So it was my first two years at the University of Albany. And, uh, you know, I think both years I, I would have qualified for food stamps. So there was a place called the Across the Street Pub, which was right across from campus. And all the GAs would take turns bouncing there. So six, seven days a week, um, you know, you'd make $5 an hour. But the whole key to it was that you could order off the menu for half price. Um, so that was also a way of getting a cheap meal and making some money. And then the other thing I did is I used to open the pool at six in the morning for $15 a day for an early morning swim group. So that was my, uh, that, that was my key to survival. Pool boy and bouncer on the same resume is an interesting little mix right there. Well, that was hard because if you ever had to go back to back, if you ever had to bounce, you were up till 1, 1 bouncing and then you had to open the pool at 5.45 in the morning. So, tough hours, tough hours. Yeah, I could not. That's not something I could do and function anymore. Back to evaluation for just one second. You said that you're still trying to get a little bit of an idea about what direction you're heading and the evaluation that's going on. And I wondered yeah, if you could I, talk I, I think, about... You know, I think every year you look at your offense and say, okay, are, is the strength in the running game or the passing game and use the one to complement the other? And then on defense, okay, do you have to put more stress on the front or the back end? Um, and, you know, we certainly have the ability to stress either in our offense and defensive packages, but at a certain point, you kind of hang your hat on the one and then the other one becomes the curveball. You like the baseball reference, Larry? I did a lot, as a matter okay. of fact. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> particularly with the evaluation of your, of your players, What's the difference between seeing them play against a Clemson where maybe they're fighting for their life a little bit and playing against Campbell where they might be dominating uh, against somebody across from them? Well, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, our outside receivers um, against Clemson, I think we hit one deep ball. Uh, and against NC State, we threw the ball to our outside receiver seven times and didn't get one completion. And then against Campbell, Torian Perry makes a nice older, over the shoulder catch. Uh, Donovan Green made a nice over the shoulder catch. Um, they're certainly capable of making those plays against better competition. And you hope from the Campbell game that, okay, there's a little bit of confidence that I can make that play and those catches against Campbell weren't any easier or more difficult than they were in the games they didn't make those plays. I mean, we dropped, you know, an open ball against NC State. Um, 
I just think sometimes for a younger player to go out there in a game and to have success and do it, the fact that you've done it in a game then allows you to do that against better competition. Now, you know, getting as open isn't as easy, getting released hasn't as easy. Um, you know, certainly the space to throw the ball gets tighter when you play better people. But Donovan and Torian are capable of making those plays. And, and so you hope that that gets carried forward uh, because we need those guys to make those plays consistently this year if we're going to throw the ball well. 